Hallelujah. Say hi, Nene Bosa. Let's give God praise. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Say hi, Nene Bosa. Family, I'm so thankful because we have been petitioning God. We've been tarrying in his presence. And what I know by faith is that the power is upon us. I'm here to tell you that I was privileged to be in the midst of believers requesting, petitioning, oh God, for the power. And I know by faith, I know by the spirit it is upon us. Let's give God praise. Let's thank him. For he hears our prayers. There's none like you, oh God. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm excited tonight. Oh, yeah, come on. This is Communion House where we fellowship, equip, and disciple. While the minstrels are here, while this sweet presence of God is here, let's take a couple of minutes. Get up, go and greet somebody across the sanctuary, and we'll be right back here in just a few seconds. Let's go ahead and start making our way back to our seats. The Lord has a wonderful night in store for us. I'm so thankful to be in His midst, to be in His presence. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. See, he through such sweet fellowship in this house. Karabasa. I want us to prepare our hearts to receive a dear brother of ours as he's going to come to share a testimony what the Lord has done in his life because we know this is a house where we give God praise. All glory belong to him. And so at this time, I'd like to welcome our dear brother, Brother Matthew. Please, let's celebrate him as he comes up. I don't have the floor, God does. Um, uh, welcome again, everybody, um, to the house of the Lord. Thank you. Um, I won't take too much of your time, but I'm just thrilled and for me personally, um, the last service was the best for me of all of them. And uh, thank you, Pastor, for speaking to us in our subconscious mind. Um, the Lord healed me of everything that night. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wasn't sure what I'd been dealing with, but it got revealed through a phone call yesterday that I was living with a scarcity mentality and didn't even know it. Um, please, I think your, God has a word from you for us that tonight because 
I don't want, we don't want anyone here to leave tonight with the scarcity mentality. And I'm talking about scarcity spiritually. So uh, to be a little more specific on the, the mission, I, you know, um, God has called me to go back overseas. Um, thank you. <laughs> so at this time for at least a year, um, and it does require, you know, a lot of prayer support and raising money. And there's an organization, uh, WDA, that's, you know, helping, you know, put everything in order. And, you know, they're saying, they told me I've got to raise, you know, at least 33 grand before I go. Which to me, you know, when I was told that, I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's, that's a lot of money. That's going to take a long time. But I got delivered from the scarcity mentality. And now it doesn't feel too overwhelming. And some dear people uh, called me yesterday and all glory to God alone. And actually I had seen in the spirit a certain amount, $10,000 check I had seen in the spirit two or three weeks ago. And then yesterday, the Holy Spirit in the morning said, go outside and call down your blessings from heaven. And I remember that our dear pastors had, had preached on that, you know, that most Christians have all these heavenly blessings, but we don't call them down and they're waiting for us. So I did that yesterday morning, yesterday morning on 1111, 11, which that equals four, one times four. And then later the day they call me and they say, we would like to offer you a matching grant check for your trip of $10,000. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, and then today I did the same thing in the morning and some other people have added $2,500 to that. Praise God. And then two other people have added $1,200 to that. So we're at a $13,700 matching grant already. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Praise God. So no one leave here with this scarcity mentality. <laughs> oh, oh, one more thing. Are we ready? Sorry. Okay. To say the inevitable and that you already know, it's my humble honor and privilege tonight to introduce to you our lead pastor, Pastor Moses Anderson. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Matthew. God bless you. Awesome, awesome. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, actually, before I get to address that testimony, I just want to say here real quick, as we were wrapping up that worship, do you remember the word that God gave to us about two weeks ago? That worship and the prophetic are now becoming interwoven at Communion House, wherein you almost won't be able to tell where one ends and another begins. So as worship was wrapping up, the singing was wrapping up. And then I was there, I switched to a different tongue. Not like I was selecting it like you would from a, what do you call that slot machine for music? Jukebox. You know, that's not how you select tongues, okay? It has to come from within. And so I just found myself speaking in a different tongue and it caught my attention that this tongue is a picture tongue. So there are some tongues that just make you feel a certain way. And there are some tongues that actually begin to create pictures for you to see in the realm of the spirit. And then I saw the picture and then there was an announcement made of in the same language that I was speaking in. And you know what it says? It says paradise has been brought here. As soon as it says paradise has been brought here, I couldn't hold back. I turned to everybody that was behind me in the spirit and I said to them, let's get in. And as soon as I said, let's get in, I saw the gates, how beautiful they are. I tell you one thing for sure, the words of the Lord Jesus, the thief that was on the cross with him was this. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. And why was that important? Because that same day, Jesus was first of all going to hell. And Jesus said to that thief, you don't worry, you will be with me in paradise. Paradise by definition is the, is the tangible presence of God that goes with you even if you are in hell. And so Jesus said, don't worry, I'm going down first before I go up. 
it might be hell around us but there is a bubble of God's presence and you will join me in that bubble and it is called paradise the world might be going to hell in a hand basket there might be tribulations and trials there might be economic turmoil and political confusion but today you will be with the Lord in paradise it is a thing of joy because we know that come what may we are secure in his love and I just want to thank Jesus for that praise the Lord <laughs> Give him praise because of his love, because of his special providence for us. Father, we thank you. I have requested for the band to stay up so that we can sing that song one more time. That the Spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is completely transformed because of the presence of God and the glory of his majesty. And some will just let you take it when you're ready. And everybody, as much as you can, soak yourself into every wording that is coming forth because these people are prophesying of the atmosphere that you are in. Dive in, tap in, and surrender to His grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. We need your presence, your kingdom come, your will be done, here as in heaven, Spirit of God, fall fresh on the name of Jesus we thank you because your love surrounds us we have overcome because of your everlasting love and that is the reason why we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus father we give you praise because we know that as your word comes forth it brings light it brings elevation it brings liberation and Lord, it brings us the wisdom by which we are able to live lives that are pleasing to you in all things and at all times. Father, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is good. Let's all be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Oh, my goodness. We give God thanks. There is nothing like the atmosphere of God's presence. There is absolutely nothing like it. God is good. Alrighty, so I'm gonna make a comment about Brother Matthew's testimony before going ahead. You see, the thing is, one of the things that the Lord was dealing with me concerning while I was standing there during worship 
is that more of us need to recognize that it is not just enough for us to receive insights and revelation. It is not enough for us to know that which has been written in God's word. It is never enough for us to know it. Somebody said this a while ago. He said, what you know that you do not do is as good as what you don't know. Because what is the point? In fact, do you know that to know a thing and to not do it, the Bible says it is sin. The word of God says, he that knows that which is good and does it not, to him it is sin. So what is the implication of that reminder? That every single one of us at all times, whilst meditating on the word of God, we should meditate on the word of God for one reason and one reason only. Now, when you meditate on the word of God, several things happen. Like I was teaching you on Tuesday, when you meditate on the word of God, because of the fact that Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We know that that word of God is going to penetrate and permeate every level of your existence. It will penetrate your bone, your marrow. It will go into your subconscious. It will dissect and correct the intentions of your heart, not just the thoughts of your mind. So while meditating on the word of God, the word of God by its own potency will do every single one of those things. However, your agenda for meditating on the word of God is what we find in Joshua chapter one verse eight, wherein the Lord God Almighty invited Joshua for a meeting. And he said to Joshua, you know that Moses, my servant, is now gone. I've taken care of him. Now the baton is in your hands. This is how you're going to lead my people to victory. He said to him, don't just conclude in your mind that this shoe that Moses left behind is too big for you. God says, don't think of that for a moment. He says, believe that you are able. That was what God was telling him because God kept repeating this statement, be bold and be strong for I am with you. Moses was a man. All of what he did, he was able to do because I was with him and I will be with you also. Do you know that some of us would hear that and just say, well, that's it. Meeting over. Let me go and lead the people. No, but God says it wasn't time for him to go until he had received the special instruction for executing the call of God upon his life. And what was that instruction? Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. It says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Why? He says that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. The reason why you and I meditate on the word of God is so that we will not be hearers of the word only, but we will be doers of the same. Let me tell you something, you know, multiple times I've explained to you the process of getting to be a doer of the word of God. Process begins like this. Recognize that these words that you are hearing or the ones that you are reading come from God. The Bible says, whosoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Paul speaking, as he was writing to Timothy, he said every scripture was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and it is there so that the young man may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So you need to first of all recognize that what you're studying and what you're hearing is the word of God. And the moment you go past recognizing and knowing what it is that you have in front of you, the Bible says that you need to also speak that word. Because you know the way God designed us, God designed us to do the things that we say. You know when someone is getting you angry, someone is really getting on your last nerves, you don't just get them and slap them. You get up and say, I will slap you. And if you say that, I will slap you, and you believe it enough, you will eventually slap them. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So your heart is already filled with slaps. And that is the reason why it comes out. Because nobody does a thing without first of all saying it. Even God. The Bible says, God said, let there be. And there was, that there was nothing made that was made without the word. 
Most of what we say, most of what we do, we say it first. So once you believe that it is the word of God, what you're hearing or what you're reading, the Bible says, do not let it depart from your mouth. And God was very strategic when he was talking to Jacob, Joshua. <laughs> he says this book of the law. Basically what he's saying is everything you read there is already law. You don't question it. You don't question the law. The law says thou shalt not steal. So you don't go to someone's grocery store and bring out a pen knife and be contemplating or debating with them and say, you know what, bro, if I rob you now, is that an issue? Because to be honest, I can use the money. So maybe we can suspend the law for a little bit. I can just take your money forcefully and go home and nothing will happen. No, you do not deliberate with that which is already law. And that is the reason why Josh Ruskin, he says to stay focused in life, you can't put a question mark where God has put a period. And so when God says things in his word, they are not questionable. That's why we'll call him the unquestionable God. And so the moment you recognize that what you're reading is unquestionable and that it is the word of God, what do you do? You go ahead and speak that word. But you don't just say it one time. You have to keep saying it. You know, the reason why many people don't keep repeating the word of God is because of a misunderstanding. When Jesus said, do not pray with much repetition of words as the heathen do because they think that by much babbling, God will hear them. So people are like, no, you don't have to keep repeating it. No, Jesus says, when you pray, don't keep repeating the same thing. But the same Jesus says that a scribe that is instructed in the things of God brings from his treasure things that are both old and new. So don't keep repeating the same thing. Load yourself with enough of the word of God such that if you want to pray for your family's salvation for an hour, you keep using different scriptures throughout that one hour period. Don't just go to God and say, John 3, 16, John 3, 16. After a while, God is like, you got anything else? Because, you know, God does not like to be bored. He says, sing unto me a new song. Jesus says, you have to keep going. You have to bring it out of your treasure. So many people do not continue to confess the word of God because they do not want to be guilty of excessive repetition. But Jesus was addressing the people who in his time would only choose one statement and keep repeating that statement to God. Thinking that by much repetition, God will hear them. He says, no, you don't have to keep repeating the same thing, but you have to continue to speak the word of God. Just be in variety as you are talking to God. I can't imagine if Brother Matthew calls me and he books to talk to me for 30 minutes and all he's saying is, how you doing? I'm like, I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing good. By the time he says that the third time, I'm going to say to him, is there anything else on your mind? You understand what I mean? Because if you've asked me three times, how am I doing? If you, by the time you ask me the fourth time, I'm no longer doing good. There's now an issue. Not because of the fact that you keep asking me the same thing. You understand what I mean? But if he says, how are you doing? And I say, I'm doing good. And he says, this is what the word of the Lord is concerning you today. As I saw in the vision, in the dream, as I was studying the book of Isaiah, the Lord said this to me and that to me. The conversation will continue going and going. Many of us can't pray for an hour, but we can talk to our gist partners for three hours every day of the week. The person that you talk to the most <laughs> is the person that you love the most. Let me tell you something. You can't talk to God for five minutes and claim that you love him. When you talk to your gist partner for 45 minutes and it's always fun. And when they tell you they have to go, you're like, oh, come on, two more minutes. Let me quickly tell you this. Let me quickly tell you that. Let me tell you something. If you truly love your heavenly father, there is no amount of time that will be too much for you to spend with him. You know, man, people say things like, well, but my gist partner can relate to me. But God can relate to you. He made you. There's everything that is going on in your life. He's aware of it. Even before it happens, he knows what choices you will make. And he knows the things that he has done concerning you. Do you know how God trained me in the area of praying for long? Apart from speaking in tongues, my speaking in tongues came because of my challenges when I was growing up. I had two things that were an issue in my life when I was about the age of 10, 11, 12. My dad was not saved. My mom wasn't saved. 
And it was beginning to bother them that we went to church all the time. So they said we were no longer going to church. And so I started having church at home. Every time my mates were in church, I would make sure the entire time from when I see them through the window, getting in the cab or driving by or walking to the bus stop, I would pray till they come back. Sometimes for five hours, six hours, I'll be praying in tongues simply because I'm like, I need to be out there. And these people have become agents of Satan in this household by not letting me go to the will, do the will of my father. So I will intercede for them repeatedly in tongues. And then at the same time, a lot of my mates could go on vacation. They could go to youth camp. I couldn't because I was still wet in my bed. And so in the middle of the night, I would wake up and I would have to go and change my clothing and put my, 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 my beddings away to dry, which meant there was no place for me to sleep. So sometimes I had no choice but to speak in tongues through the night that God would deliver me from the infirmity. I didn't have, a, no one had to teach me how to speak in tongues and pray for long because I had issues that I was dealing with at a very tender age. But guess what? The Lord taught me how to pray in understanding for long because I wouldn't have anything to say to him. And then he said to me, what about your friends at school? Do you not have stuff to say to them? I said, yes, because when we were in math class, this happened and it was funny. When we were playing soccer, this happened and it was funny. And the Lord said to me, exactly. He says, you and I need to experience the same things together. So he told me to go into his word and start studying the experiences that others had before me and make it my own. So I started to read the story of David. David was the most relatable person to me when I started studying the Bible. And I started to see myself in his shoes. I would imagine that I was the one that was going to feed my brothers. I would imagine that I was the one that was fighting the bear, the lion, and all of those things. And before long, I had something to talk to God about. Like, God, wasn't it cool? How you allayed my fears when that bear showed up. Because before I heard the roaring of the animal, I felt your breath on my back. That gave me confidence. Let me tell you something. Many of us don't recognize that there is nobody in scripture that walked with God that you could not take the place of. <laughs> Let me tell you something. They are made from the same dirt as you. From dust they came and to dust they will return. Solomon says, naked I came into this world and naked will I return because all is vanity. Job said the same thing. Job was like, I didn't bring anything here and I'm not taking anything with me. And so that person that you see that had a relationship with God did not import that relationship from heaven. They found it here by seeking the Lord. The moment you catch that revelation, you will begin to see yourself as a friend of God. If Abraham was called a friend of God, then I want to study his life. I want to know what things he did to qualify as a friend of God. One of the things that you will find is that there isn't anything they have done to qualify. They only do things that help them to recognize what they already are in Christ Jesus. You didn't hear that. Let me tell you something. Nobody ever does anything to qualify to be God's friend. Enoch that walked with God. The Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. It wasn't the fact that he was doing things. That was what got the attention of God and God was like, Ooh, okay, I like this one. No, the Bible says for God so loved the world. It was the things he did, he did for himself. To bring him to a place of recognizing that God wants him all the time and he made himself available to God all the time. And God is like, well, I don't have to chase this one around, so you might as well just stay here all the days of your life. So the ball is always in our court. We need to recognize that God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Your closeness to God is a function of your closeness to God. How close you are to God is a function of how close you want to be to Him. Move close to Him, spend time with Him, talk to Him, tell Him about the things that are going on in your life. I went through the process of studying the life of David. From there, I moved on to Moses. I started to study the ones that we call the elders of faith. And after a while, I was sounding to God as though God was from the King James era. So when I'm talking to God in my prayers, I'll be sent to the Lord. And I went test to school today. Because that was what I was reading. I was reading King James English. And one day the Lord said to me, this is not fun anymore. You don't talk to your friends like that. I said, but you are God. He says, but I am not just God, I am your friend. And so I immediately just dawned on me that when my friends came 
to see me, we wouldn't speak even proper English because proper English was boring. We would speak broken English, which is like patwa. And so I turned around in that moment and I started to speak to God in broken English. I prayed for hours and it was so much fun. I was talking to God, I was laughing, I was giggling, I was jumping where I was simply because the conversation came to life. God is not as far away as you were told. God is nearer than the ones who told you. Because where are they today? But God is still here. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The people who tell you that God is far away, then they may not be lying. To them, they may be far from God. So they're telling you exactly what they know. The Bible says what, what you have is what you give. And so if, every, if anyone is telling you that you have to fast for seven days and go to a mountain and do this and that before you find God, that's because that's what they tried before they got somewhat close to God. But the Bible says only believe. Whosoever must come to him must first of all believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So I need to seek him so that I can find him. The Lord said to Joshua, he said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Folks, the immunity to self-defeat and the antidote to being robbed of the joy of salvation is one thing, and that is doing the word of God. James, he said, do not be hearers of the word alone, deceiving yourselves. He says, but be doers of the word. He said, because if you don't, you may have faith, but if you don't have the works, your faith is dead. He said, because the way I show you my faith is by my works. And so I want to encourage you folks, do the word, do what it says. Here is Matthew. On Tuesday before we left, what did I tell us? I said we should go and study the book of Matthew. I said study Matthew and then I was pointing to him. And then I said, well, I'm talking about the book of Matthew. But in reality, if you study this one, you're not going to be too much amiss because he's dedicated to answering the call of God upon his life. And look at how today, just a few days later, he stands here once again, an example of a believer. He said he woke up and realized that on Tuesday, I had said by the Holy Spirit that each and every one of us should go home and stand by our windows and announce to the wind to go bring our blessings because now we're ready. Why were we not ready for the blessings initially? Because of those issues in the intricacies of our being. Because of the unresolved issues in our subconscious mind, God was not allowing for us to engage the blessing so that the blessing does not become a burden. But the moment the Lord came through and he says, today I am performing an, op an operation. I am performing and doing a work amongst you. Let me say it the way he said it. He says, I came in and I was performing the work of restoration. And so because the Lord came in to do a work of healing in our hearts upon our subconscious minds he was also the one that announced and said now I have strengthened the arms that were feeble call for the blessings to come now because now you can hold the blessing look at the transformation what did brother Matthew say to us the first thing that he had a recognition of was that no I say no to any mentality of scarcity any mentality that says, oh, this is too much for God to do. I say no to that because that was the reason why the blessing wasn't coming because his arm of faith was not strong enough to receive it. But the moment he shook the beast into the fire, the beast of unbelief and limitations, guess what? The phone started ringing. God is not a magic working God. He's a miracle working God. Yeah. And to every miracle, there is a method. Magicians, they do things by sleight of hand. They're not going to let you know what, you, what they're doing. But because God is not working magic, he tells you what he is doing. He says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. It's not by magic that things spring from out of the ground. You put a seed in the ground and do what you must do. Guess what? There will be a harvest because the ground has been instructed to cooperate with you. The Bible says, and when the good seed fell upon the good soil, the ground all by itself produced a harvest. So everything else around you is in cruise control. The only thing that has a willpower that chooses to flow with God or not is you. The rain does not have a mind of its own. Imagine if the rain had its own will. 
Then sometimes it will skip some people's houses because they're just so bad. Because if I was the rain and I was coming down from heaven, I know some of my neighbors that I will not rain on. Why? Because they don't cut their grass. So why do they need more water? Because their grass is just going to grow and they're not going to cut it. By my own judgment, I will skip them. But the Bible says that when God releases the rain, he falls on the good and the wicked because the rain is an equal opportunity blesser. And so what does that mean to you and I? What it means is that everything else that is required for your miracle to happen has already been told to do what they do. So you are the only one in the equation of your blessing that determines whether it happens or not. So when you receive the word of God with meekness, the Bible says receive the implanted word of God with meekness because it is able to save your soul. James chapter one, let me tell you something. Some people walked away from this ministry a while ago and I was not mad. You know why? Because the couple, especially the husband, they never received the word of God with meekness. Whatever you're saying, they want to out talk you. They want me to help me finish everything I'm saying. And by the time they say whatever is coming out of their mouth, it doesn't even match what the Holy Spirit is saying. And you think the fellow would repent? No, he continued in dead works. Because to such a person, the word of God is not doing good. Why? Because the word of God is not meant to be received in pride and in boastfulness and in self-confidence. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So when you think you know, even that which you think you know, then becomes the all mark of your ignorance. I was not mad because the Lord Jesus had been warning me concerning them. Because even sometimes I will look at them and I will prophesy and the Holy Spirit will say to me, I know that you have the gift and you can see stuff, but I've been telling you, stop casting your pearl before swine. So the only way the word of God is going to do you good is if you receive that word with meekness. You receive it in godly humility. That is when it will do you good. But if you think you have something that is more than what Jesus is saying, then you don't even get anything at all. Look at the rich young ruler. Instead of him to listen and to receive with meekness what Jesus was saying, he was boasting of the things that he had to say. And we knew what happened to him. The Bible says he went away sorrowful. How can you meet the Lord Jesus and go away sorrowful? When the Bible says that he is the joy of the world. When Jesus was born as a little baby in the manger, the angels were like, oh my goodness, we're, we're envious of humanity. We're envious of the people on the earth because our joy has come to be with them. They were not invited. It was not in prophecy that they were going to be around, but they showed up. The angels came and they kept saying, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Simply because when he was in heaven, he was their joy. And when he came to the earth, he brought all that joy. And somebody met Jesus and went away sorrowful. The Bible says that God gave his word and his word heals them freely. Do you know how many times we engage the word of God and we do not receive our healing? Simply because we believe what the doctor said more than what the word of God is saying. Many a times you believe what the headache is saying more than what the word of God is saying. Many of us will go to the church of symptoms and we believe everything that the symptoms are telling us. Whereas we need to just believe what the word of God is saying. Symptoms are fleeting. They are here today. They are gone tomorrow. But the Bible says the word of God is forever. I was doing some work around the neighborhood today. And then the Holy Spirit just came alongside. You know, in reality, when the Bible says Jesus speaking, he says, I am going that the Father may send his Holy Spirit. He will send you another comforter, one that is called alongside. That expression in the Greek language was called alos parakleto, which means another of the same kind. The word alos means another of the same kind. Parakleto means one that has been called to be alongside with you. And when the Holy Spirit comes to you, sometimes he comes literally just like that. You just feel his presence come alongside with you and he came alongside with me and he wanted to report to me certain things that was going on in the body of Christ you know what he said he said do you know that there are some people who think that God needs more people I had to think about it for a moment because he had nothing to do with what I was doing at the moment it was completely almost like from a left field that was not what I was thinking about and the Holy Spirit said he said see let me tell you something a little secret most of us we're still struggling to hear God concerning what we put before him. That is stage one. You need to be able to quiet the noise 
to hear God concerning what you have put before him. Once you get well grounded in that capacity, you will start to hear God about things that concern him. Let me say that again. There are certain times that God will come to you and he will start talking to you about things that you haven't even thought about. Because he knows that you have such the receptiveness to his voice that even if it's not of your interest primarily or initially, you will turn around and make it your interest. So he said to me that there are still people around the world and he was talking about Christians. He says, they keep thinking that the father needs more people. He said, but God does not need more people. It is Satan who needs people. God does not need what he already has. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Ezekiel says every soul belongs to God. So nobody can even sell their soul. You can't sell what is not yours. You can only sell your allegiance, but you can't sell your soul because that soul is not yours. So the Holy Spirit says, God already has everybody. Satan is the one that is looking for people that will pluck themselves as prodigal children out from underneath God so that he can snatch them into his army. He says, God does not need more people. He says, but more people need God. He said that to me, and then he just wanted me to think about it. I had to drop everything that I was holding because that word was heavy. I sat down for a moment and I started to think about it. And I'm like, whoa. Almost everywhere you go in the world, people are desperately trying to tell people, oh, <laughs> you need to be born again. You need to come, you need to come to God. God is really desperate in these people. We need more people to come into the kingdom. Whereas the people who are already in the kingdom, they are the ones who actually need more of God. If we do not think about how to get more of God, we will be operating outside of what God is doing in this season. It is very critical what people like Matthew do, which is to go into all the world preaching the gospel, bringing people fresh into the fold because those people don't even have anything. So you give them the good news which is you're giving them more of God. So they accept God and they have to grow in grace. But in the world today, we have crossed the mark. There are more of us now who know about God than who don't. You understand what I mean? And so the, the attention and the focus now shifts not to aggressively Going out, because let me tell you something, it costs the kingdom of God more now for you to go find that one soul that hasn't heard from God than for you to be able to give more of God to those who are around you. And I'll tell you the reason, I'll tell you one of the reasons why that is important or why I believe the Holy Spirit inspired that in me today. When I was meditating on that, I just kept it to myself. I was thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And one of the things that I realized is this. Satan needs us to get anything done. Because remember, we are the ones with the dominion. There is nothing that gets done on earth without a man. Even when angels come on assignment, they find a man to deliver the message of God too. With the exception of things that the earth has already been equipped to do because the angels can partner with the earth in getting things done because the earth has already been told that you do this and you do that. The earth system includes the firmament, the stars of the heavens and the wind that blows upon the face of the earth. So you see that sometimes angels will go and do things in the wind. They will stir up the waters. They will do all of those things but they are done as signs to indicate to people that it's time for them to do what the Lord has commanded. So ultimately nothing really gets done without man because that was the way God designed it. If God did not require man, why would he become flesh that he may die on the cross? He was already, the Lamb of God was already slain even before the foundations of the earth but for it to become valid, he became 
Amen. That's why Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So because man is critical to getting anything done, Satan sold us on the mentality of more people needed instead of more God needed. Because you can have a million people professing to be Christians. Almost anywhere you go in the world today. Let me ask you, when was the last time that you met 10 people in one day who have never heard about Jesus? Almost everybody knows about Jesus. They have just chosen to, they will say things like, well, I believe that there is a God who made everything, especially with this new age concept. You know, but I don't think it's like a person like that. It's just energy. It's the universe. It's the this and that. But in reality, they know that they are living in a system that is by intelligent design. The fact that they have not accepted the person of the Lord Jesus Christ does not mean that they're ignorant of his being. It's just that they are rebellious to his call. So at the end of the day, the focus should be how then can we give more of God to these same people who already know of him who are just not opening their hearts to receive him. Do you know that everybody that was a participant in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from the wise men who came from the east, was a Jewish person who knew from time immemorial, from the time that they were born and they were taken to the synagogue, that one day the Messiah was going to be born. And yet when it was time to give birth to Jesus, there was no room in the inn. But God had people. But those people didn't have God. And after thinking about it for a little while, the Holy Spirit said to me, he says the reason why many people will remain in darkness is because the ones who have found the light are not taking the form of that light. If you and I would allow ourselves to incubate more of God, guess what? Those people who are still in darkness will not have any problem with engaging God because every time you show up and I show up, they will see the light. I'm going to give you a perfect example from the book of Matthew. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit descended upon him, appeared upon him as a dove and that voice came from heaven and the Lord says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Do you know the proclamation that was made to the world? The Bible says, rejoice those of you of the region of Zebulon and Naphtali simply because now you who have been in the darkness, sitting in the darkness will now see the light. He didn't say to them, run and go and embrace the light. He says, you're sitting in the darkness. Don't worry because Jesus is passing by. If more of us would have more of God, then we don't have to worry about the people who are still sitting in the dark. And the way that this is going to happen is by simply learning the principles of becoming the Word. You see, the Bible says that the Word became flesh so that flesh can become the Word. Jesus did not give you his life so that you can give him yours. I mean, at the end of the day, that's not a fair exchange, is it? He came with a glorious life and he laid it down. Do you think he did that so that he can just take your own life that wasn't going anywhere? No. Jesus came to lay down his life as an example of what you must become. You must become as he was. He says, as I am, so are you. Go and shine. He says, I am the light. You are the light. As I, am, as I am, so are you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said that to his disciples again and again so that they would recognize that anybody who encounters them encounters the way. Anybody who encounters them encounters the truth because ultimately where we need to be is that place wherein we are constantly looking into that mirror so that we can become like Christ from glory to glory. So the summary of the things that God's been telling us lately is what I just told you. He said to us, pray. He, to, he told us to wait and watch with him an hour. Every single one of those things that we do, we're not doing those things so that God can feel like we're supporting his mission. We're not doing those things so that the kingdom of God will not lose the battle of Armageddon. No, that's not why we're doing those things. We're doing those things so that we can be a part of what he is doing. We're doing those things so that we can reduce and he can increase within us. Because the ultimate goal is for you and I to be like Christ. He said to Joshua, he says, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you shall make your way prosperous and have good success. What is good success? 
good, a success that is good is when what you begin finishes the way you expected it. When God began you and I, Shayla, Alan, Kenyatta, when God started us, what was his objective? He started us so that we can be like Christ. The Bible says that except a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. Jesus died so that he can raise sons and daughters unto God according to his similitude. So you are only successful at life when you become like Christ. And how do you become like Christ? By saying what he says and by doing what he does. But you will not say what he says or do what he does if you don't even know what he said or know what he did. And that is the reason why we need to study the word of God. I came to you last week with the fire of God burning in my bones telling you that you need to learn at least how to pray for an hour. And I gave an allowance. I said for some of us, it's new to us. Maybe you can do 30 minutes here. And then top up your 30 minutes later. But I don't expect that to last more than two or three weeks before you are able to do a full on one hour. You understand what I mean? Because 30 minutes to some people is like three hours. I get it. I've been there. When you start out, sometimes it feels like forever. I remember back in the day, I would pray and my face would be covered with spit. And I would check the time and it's going to be just five minutes. Slap my watch a couple of times. It's still five minutes. I will come out and go and ask the neighbors, hey, what's the time? Five and a half minutes. Let me tell you something. It used to frustrate the heck out of me because I'm like, did I go into eternity and come back? I got a little relief when I read the book by Robert Leadon when he says, I saw heaven. He was in heaven for like what felt like days and when he came back, it was only like four hours. I was like, yeah, maybe I was in heaven because on earth, it's still five minutes. It used to feel very long. But guess what? After a while, those minutes will be nothing. An hour will be nothing. Yesterday, my wife and I were praying together. We decided to do our one hour together. And after an hour, my alarm went off. It went off. I still kept praying. So instead of just 60 minutes, at 62 minutes, I stopped it. And I went to tap my wife. And she was saying, mama, 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 mama. I said, woman, I'm hungry. It's already an hour. But to her, it wasn't an hour. She was like, what kind of clock are you using? We just got here. <laughs> I said, no, we didn't. That's why I set an alarm, because easily we could have been there for hours and then missed the school run. You understand what I mean? But it wasn't like that at the beginning. Then I tell on my wife a little bit? When I met my wife, she was a good Christian. No, sorry, Catholic, Catholic girl. She would show up at church. But if you were praying for longer than 30 seconds, she would open her eyes and be looking at you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because now when we're praying and whenever we want to bless the food, I open one eye. And my wife is always like, why are you doing that? That's why, because I learned it from you. You used to open both eyes to look at me. After 30 seconds of prayer, she's had enough. In fact, let me tell you, she would start talking if your prayer was getting longer than two minutes. She would remind everybody at church, oh, that the boss is going to leave in five minutes. I think we all need to get done. And you're still praying. Because to her, two minutes was too long. But these days, sometimes I will fall asleep and my wife is still praying. Yeah, I would have to go and, you know, disturb her sometimes. I'm like, you know, the Bible says minister to those who minister to you spiritually, minister to them in material things. I need material ministration. <laughs> I would have to tell my wife, woman of God, you need to learn how to cut it short in righteousness. Because if I left her to her own devices, she will pray all the time. And I'm like, ah, you can pray all the time. But let me tell you something, man is indeed flesh. That's what the Bible says. In Genesis, the Bible says, God speaking, he says, my spirit will not forever strive with man because he's indeed flesh and all the thoughts of his heart are evil continually. Because sometimes my wife is like, are you always thinking about this thing? I'm like, yes. <laughs> always. The times that I'm not thinking about it is because I am putting my body under. That was what Paul said. Paul says, I put my body under because if not, I'm not even able to focus on the presence of God. He says, what is this messing out of Satan that continues to buffet me, this body of death? Who would deliver me from it? You have to learn to put it under. Uh -oh. That's a real man of God. <laughs> but I want to, I, I say that to encourage you that if you're struggling to pray for one hour straight, 
The only way to overcome it is to practice it. You need to keep doing it. The more you do it, the more you get better at it. The first time you drove, you nearly killed yourself. But then guess what? Now you can drive almost with your eyes closed. But please don't. But what I'm saying is this. The Bible says that by reason of use, we have our senses sharpened. The man of God who raised us in ministry, the Apostle George, one day he went before the Lord and he kept saying, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. And the Lord asked him, how? He said, I want to do the things that he did. And the Lord says, tell me what things he did. And he said, um, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. And God says, where, when, how? And he didn't know. Because he only had a summary knowledge of the ministry of Jesus, not the details. And so God was like, so exactly how do you want to be like Jesus when you do not even have the blueprint of who you want to be like? <laughs> The Bible says we beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. When you look in the mirror, you should see details. But there was no detail. And so the Holy Spirit said to him, before you come and ask anything again, go and study the ministry of Jesus. He started studying every month. At least once he would read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you know that there are 89 chapters between Ma from Matthew to John? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 89 so if you read three chapters a day, in fact, let me make it easy for you. The first chapter of the book of Acts is essentially part of the Gospels because that was still Jesus speaking to his disciples as he would speak to them in any chapter of Mark or John. And so add that first chapter of the book of Acts to the 89 and what do you get? You get 90. Three chapters a day. Three times 30. 90 days. Every month. We'll give you a pass in February. Which means on Valentine's Day, you read six. Hmm. That makes it even more of a sacrifice. You understand what I mean? Can I teach you one of the things that God helped me with to be able to study the Word of God? The Holy Spirit will walk with me this way. The moment he, I identify something as important to me, the Holy Spirit will say, you like that stuff? You want to do that stuff? He says, okay, from now until this time or until further notice, you don't do that stuff until you have read five chapters of the Bible. Yeah, because he knows me. He knows I'm easily distracted. If he doesn't attach the study of the word of God to something that I need to do or something that I enjoy doing it, I will make excuses every day. So do you like checking on what's going on with your NFL league, right? Make a commitment to not open that site or check that email until you have read at least three chapters of the Bible. Because you know what you do is you use what you have to get what you need. You have a flesh that is always nagging you to do things. Use all that nagging as a fuel to propel your commitment to the things of the Spirit. Use that. There are things that I like to eat. But then... There were seasons in my life where I'm not allowed to eat it until I have completed a book of the Bible. And so I'm looking forward for the joy that was set before me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I remember there was a time when I was messing with one little girl. All things have passed away. All things have become new. This was long before I met my wife. Okay, so let's be in the spirit here. I, I was in like fourth year. I was supposed to be in my fourth year at the university, even though I was on a, on a protracted leave of absence. And then we, we, we broke up. She, we, we got angry with each other. I don't remember the details. And I concluded in my heart that I was going to ask her to come back. But the Holy Spirit's been trying to get me to study the life of Job. And I refused. I made excuses every time. So I got up one day and I said, I'm going to go and find her and tell her that I was sorry. And the Holy Spirit said to me, if you wanted to succeed, study the book of Job. And I'm like, oh, this is not funny. He says, well, you need to study the book of Job. So I had to pin myself down. I read it one time. It was so sweet. I read it again. By the time I was done, I didn't even want her back. Simply because a lot of what I was going after, the Lord revealed to me that it was just me and it wasn't him. 
Do you know that there are times wherein there are certain things that you're so convinced of because the heart of men is deceitful and desperately wicked that you will defend your position in unrighteousness without even knowing it? That was the summary of the book of Job. Job and his friends, they were fighting each other. They were arguing every day. Every one of them was right. Job thought he was right. Bildad thought he was right. Zophar thought he was right. And what's the other guy's name? Elihu. He thought he was right. All four of them thought they were right. And they would argue. They argued for days. And the Bible says that they did not even have time to eat because each one of them was so convinced that they were right. They were feeding off of their own ego. When I studied it, then I realized that it is possible for a man to have a conviction that seems to be fiery and yet it has no flame. <laughs> Because I thought I was convinced. I thought I was a man of the spirit. I thought I was a man of the word. I was so convinced. But then at the end of the day, I noticed that as convinced as Job was, he was his conviction was based on nothing. Until the Holy Spirit came alongside with him. And then he said that prayer that I will never forget. That none of us should even ever forget. Job went to God and he says, Lord, by arguing we have proven nothing. Show each of us wherein we have gone wrong. And the Lord raised for them a man who came and spoke in all humility. He says, I do not even have the understanding nor the experience of you noble men. And he gave them a bow. He says, wisdom is with you. Whereas in reality, foolishness was with them. It was revealing to them where their heart was. They thought they had wisdom. But then he started to question the fundamentals of their understanding. And he reduced them by the grace of God to the babes that they were. So by the time God dealt with them, each one of them was ready to hear what God was saying. I say all of that to say this to you folks. As we wrap up today. That no matter what it is, you should find every reason. Every method. Every way. To get into the word of God. The world needs people who have more God. As opposed to a God who has more people. God already has all the people that he would ever have. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, it says, Of the ones you have given to me, none shall be lost. He was declaring a divine covenant or a seal upon the ones that the Father has given to him. So why should I be more concerned about that than I am or than I should be concerned with how much of God is on the inside of me? And this is the way to get God inside of you, his word. Study the word of God and pray. Let me tell you something. God is doing a new thing upon the earth. He is raising people that will enjoy his company, people whose company he will also enjoy. And you want to be one of those people. Let me tell you something. We are coming to a time of power once again. And when you come into a, a time of power, the people who move in the power are the ones who are where they're supposed to be by God and in one accord. You need to be in sync with the Lord. You see, because let me tell you what God does. And I was telling you about the rain, how the rain comes and it rains upon the good and upon the wicked. Right? That is very general. That's very generic. When the sun shines, it shines on everybody. When the rain falls, it falls on everybody. But that's not what God is looking for. God is looking for what you are going to do about the sun that shines and the rain that falls. And that is, the, that is where our uniqueness begins to show. Let me say that again. You see, there is a uniqueness about you that God is seeking that is the reason why he wants to have fellowship with you. Because there are certain things that God can enjoy doing with Zoe that will not be the same if he did it with Shayla because she's a different. The Bible says in every house there are many vessels, some unto honor and some unto dishonor. But no two vessels are the same in the house of God. Everything is unique in this composition and divinely unique in this delivery. That is why the Bible says that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people of peculiarities. The old King James Bible says we're a peculiar people. But you know that that is already an oxymoron. Because you cannot have a people that is peculiar. How can you say that we're unique, diverse? It's like, 
but you just said we're diverse and you say we're unique. We're a people. People are meant to be diverse. Make up your mind. Which is, which is it? He says that, but the true meaning of it is that we are a people of peculiarities. Every single one of us, when God looks at a sea of people, he sees each and every one of us unique, one different from the other. The only person that wants all of us to be the same is Satan because Satan is almost just like you. And so when you're too different, he gets confused. That's why he wants everybody to dress the same way, everybody to talk the same way, everybody swears alike, everybody dress almost dresses naked alike everybody doesn't seek God alike because that way then he can manage them the world system is trying to make every one of us the same because the kingdom of God teaches unity by diversity but Satan encourages unity by uniformity because if he can get all of you to be uniform then he can manage you if you can get every one of us to go, to go through the same school system that teaches us that we don't have to worry about our creativity, we just have to worry about our ability to copy other people, then Satan can get to expect no surprises. Everybody will do the same. But God is saying, no, I don't want you to try to be like the other person. I just want you to be like Christ. You see, because if every one of us is like Christ, then none of, no two of us will be the same. Let me, let me tell you something. If I'm not striving to be like Christ, I would have to be like somebody. Because I am clay, I need a mold. And so the moment I don't get to be like Christ, then I may have to be like manual leader. And that would be a shame. Because I can never be as good a manual leader as this manual leader. You know why? I can copy everything manual leader is doing today so that I can follow everything that she will do tomorrow and predict what she's going to do in the future. But I will never be able to have the past that manual leader has. And a man is made in the image and in the likeness of God. Antoine, you are not just who you are today and who you will be tomorrow. You are who you were also. Because God was, is, and needs to come. It takes the totality of the three to bring about the consolidation of what it means to have a man. That's why I can never be like anybody. But if I choose to be like Christ, then no one ever, no one would ever be like me. You know why? Because the Bible says in Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The totality of variance is in Christ Jesus. Can I prove that to you mathematically? I've done the math. You see, Jesus says that with men, things can be probable. Probability always has its own limits. It's called the determinant. But let me tell you something. Possibility has no limit. Possibility is always diverse, is always unique. And that's why it says with men, it might be a probability, but with me, it is always a possibility. And the moment that possibility happens, it's already taken. Another possibility comes in its place. Be like Christ. Study the word. Let's look at one more thing very quickly. If I, let's, let's cut it short in righteousness. I want us to pray. So today, by the grace of God, as we break bread, we will pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Lord said that there is something in here that you need to take home. There is something in this atmosphere that you need to take home. The Lord is gracing us to take the workbook that is on the table of this classroom home so that when you get home, so don't give out the communion until I've said this. Once you receive the communion today, you're not eating it here, you are taking it home. Every one of us will have it when we get home. That's what the Lord is revealing to me and by so doing, you are taking with you the workbook that is available in this classroom, you're taking it home so that you can execute following the instructions that came by the Holy Spirit. What happens is quite often many of us will come here, we receive the instrumentation of the Word of God and when we get home, we try to reproduce the same but we do not have the tools. And that is the reason why it's like, oh, when I was in class, the teacher was writing that thing on the board. I thought I remembered it. And now I'm trying to remember it. And you'll be chewing the butt, the butt of your pen. And after a while, you get frustrated. You get up and you go and play. If you were me. But if you were somebody else, you go and sleep. But the Lord is saying, let them take that communion home today as a way of engaging that which is the instrumentation of the word in here today. You see, Jesus says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. The power of remembrance is embedded in the communion so when you take this home with you today you shall remember all that was said in here today by the oracle 
so that there will be no missteps, there will be no mishaps. You will deliver your payload. And what is that payload? A man of God that is thoroughly furnished unto every good work, that is expressing himself daily by the Holy Spirit in the full image of Jesus Christ. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, because that which I know gives me the power to become. If I'm going to become like Christ, I must know him. The Apostle George, he ended the story by telling us, he continued the story rather by telling us that after about four months or so of studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, three chapters a day, so that every month he completed the, the Gospels. He was still studying other aspects of the Bible and he was reading books by other people and he was still preaching and teaching. He was a lecturer at a higher institution in town. He was still living his life with children, but he was doing that every single day. Let me tell you something. At that time, I remember he had a farm where he planted peas, black-eyed peas. And it was a huge farm. Such that whenever he went to inspect the farm and he came back, he became Adam. You know what Adam is? Adam means red. It will be red from head to toe because of the dust of the field. That was how big his farm was. And he was a, he was a professor at a college. He was pastor in a church, running the deliverance ministry. He was married to a woman, praise God, and he had children. And he was also instrumental in his neighborhood. He was someone that was known in the community. And yet he was still able to study this thing. Now what is my excuse? What is your excuse? You understand what I mean? He said after like four months of doing that, he fell asleep while reading the Gospels. And he found himself in the tomb of Lazarus. He found himself in the tomb of Lazarus. He was able to count the steps. He saw the man wrapped in, 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 in linen as he was laying there while he was in that tomb. He heard the voice of the Lord Jesus calling Lazarus to come forth. He saw the process of the resurrection power, pick that man up and present him at the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. His life, ministry and everything around him was never the same after that moment. He would lay his hands on people after that moment and they would be healed. He will pray for people and they will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will be praying and he will be teaching and people will come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and give their lives to Christ. My mom happened to have gotten born again while this man was teaching. He wasn't even taking the altar call. He was just teaching from scripture. And my mom, who had been an ardent unbeliever, she came to church that day because somebody robbed her and she was so dejected. She just needed something fun to do. She went to bed, she drunk herself to stupor, woke up and she was too sad. She was like, I think I'm gonna to come to church today. Cause she knows that we go there and we clap and we sing. She just wanted something fun to do. No conviction, nothing, but just something to encourage her a little bit cause she was sad cause she just lost money. She lost about 11,000 pounds and she thought the world was gonna end. This was in 1989. That was a lot of money back then. And so when she came to church and the man of God was preaching, without even addressing her personally, the power of the Holy Spirit was so tangible in that room that somebody that everybody had known to be the party animal of the town gave her life to Christ. So what am I saying? When you study who Christ is, it qualifies you. By my definition, remember, of qualification to be like him. It allows you to open yourself up to that which is a divine possibility before you were formed. Anyway, to cut the long story short, folks, because I get excited when I'm talking about being like Christ. Let me tell you something. The reason why, I'm going to tell you real quick, okay? Even though I'm doing so good with time, I don't want to blow it. When I came to America, my wife and I, when we came to America, I had given up on ministry just because of past disappointments. I've been hurt, I've been burnt, I've been bruised, I've been broken. So I said I wasn't doing ministry anymore. But when we came to America, after two years of traveling as a consultant, traveling the world, consulting, not very present with my family, when we came to America, I knew we were gonna be seeing each, other, seeing each other almost every day, and I didn't know how to tell my wife that I wouldn't do ministry. All the time that I was consulting, I got away from ministry for years. I wouldn't even go to church regularly. But once you came, I was like, okay, this is it. There's no way I am. That's why accountability is important. I couldn't wake up and have my wife look at me a way other than a man of God. I just couldn't. I felt I would feel really bad if my wife would look at me and not see a man of God. 
And so I started to open my mind to God again. I started to say, well, you got me good, God. You got me. And so my wife and I went to have dinner with one of my cousins. And the wife said to me, she says that the general overseer of the redeemed Christian church of God was going to be in town. And she said, if you want a parish, which is to have a denomination of the church, a lot of what will start the church will be paid for. I would even get a band and some people to come and help me start the church. She said, if you want one, if you think you're ready, you just have to say it and we'll make a phone call. Wow, that sounded really great. I'm like, man, God heard my prayers. Now I can say yes, and then I'm going to be pastor in the local church with the potential to grow it with support from everywhere. And but my cousin looked at me and I could see the fire of God in his eyes. He first of all told his wife, he said, well, I like your generosity and your encouragement for the young man, but let's not assume he's ready. So he asked me, he said, are you ready? He looked at my wife and I, and we're like, uh, mm, yeah, I, I think so. He says, you, he says, okay, if you're ready, what is your message to the people? He said, because you can't be God's messenger without a clear message from God. Everyone that God calls, God calls with a message. When John the Baptist was called, he was called with one message to, pre to prepare the way of the Lord. Preaching repentance. When Jesus came, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The opening of prison doors to them that are held captive and to announce the great day of God's salvation. He says, I've come to declare jubilee to the poor, to preach the gospel. Everybody has their own message. Jeremiah has a message from God. To do what? To uproot and to pull down, to break and to build up. Everybody has their own message. Adam had his own message to go around preaching to creation. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Everybody has their message. He said, what is your message to the people? That was when I knew that I wasn't ready. He said, let me tell you something. He says, when you have a message, all these things that man is offering you, God will give you. This was December of 2012. He completely ruined my dinner, but he saved me from ruining my life. And when we decided, when God came to me and gave me a message, and we were ready to start communion house, April of 2018, he called me out of the blues. I hadn't even really told him anything about what we were doing. He knew that I was an associate pastor at the church that we were at. He just called me. He says, take your pen and write down these words. And he recited to me prophetically by the Holy Spirit the same thing God told me in my closet about why we're starting communion house. And he said to me, in his dictation, he says, the Lord Jesus is raising you that you may show others how to be like him. So that's why I get excited whenever I get a chance to talk about what it takes, the instrumentation of replicating Jesus in your existence. And so you will take that bread home today by the grace of God. Break that bread with your family. If you live alone, break it by yourself. And just know that all of what is available in here today that will keep you alert, that will make you awake, that would allow for you to have the commitment, the integrity, integrity and the accountability to ensure that you become like Christ, it will become available to you. Isn't that awesome? If anybody told you that that was what you were getting here today, wouldn't you have, wouldn't you have come earlier? Wouldn't you have been more excited? You see, but that is what happens. That's why God says that when we're coming into his presence, we should come in, we should come very delighted. David says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord because you just never know what God might be giving out on the day. And what is given out today is an invitation and a reminder, praise the Lord, of the empowerment that is already available to you. Royce, can you help me keep mine so I don't leave it here at the altar? Let me memorize the serial number so you don't... Mix it with yours. I'm just kidding. The Bible says the two shall become one. Alrighty. So today, one of the things that I want to pray for you concerning, pray over you concerning, is this. Many of us have the good intentions. We have the desires to be like him. You see, but we are unable to push away the flesh. You see, your carnal consciousness and I'm not describing this because I found it in the textbook. I am describing this to you today because when I came in here, as we were about to start service, I put down my coffee next to my Bible and the Holy Spirit showed to me a bunch of people who seemed like they had just come out of the grave, but in reality, they could not roll away the stone. They have the desire, something within them has come to life, but they can't get it out. Imagine if Jesus was raised from the dead and he was still in the tomb, unable to come out. You would have a savior that you don't even know is alive. 
But the Bible says that the angel of the Lord came and he rolled away the stone so that the Lord Jesus Christ can come out to declare the victory that has your name on it. So many of us in here today, we have the consciousness, the awareness, and the awakening to seek the Lord with all of our hearts, to pray, but the weightiness of the flesh is getting in the way. You need help. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit loves us and he is the divine orchestrator. Of all the days, have I ever told you the story about Apostle George and the, and the grave of Lazarus, the tomb of Lazarus? No. But in reality, I just remembered now that that was what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said to me, he says, my people today are Lazarus. They need help. Do you know the meaning of Lazarus? Lazarus means the one that needs help. That's the meaning of Lazarus. Lazarus means the one that needs what? The one that needs help. And what help did Lazarus need? He needed resurrection power. That was the help that he needed. You cannot raise yourself from the dead. It doesn't matter how anointed you are. You cannot raise yourself from the dead. Jesus was anointed. He raised several dead people. But when he came to his own death, he had to be raised by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal body by his Holy Spirit. If Jesus had to be raised from the dead, you, my friend, are Lazarus. You need help. You cannot come out of that place on your own. You're trying to beat the flesh with the flesh. Oh my goodness, there is nothing the flesh loves more than knowing that you don't even know how to beat it. <laughs> the flesh is watching you and you're trying to be a praying Christian by your willpower. You're trying to be a studying, a word studying believer by your own consciousness or conscious. Oh, the flesh is like, he's calling other demons like, hey, 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 come and see this fool. You can't get it done. Let me tell you something. The Bible says it is not of him that wills, nor, nor of him that runs, but it is of God that shows mercy. It is not by power, nor by might. But the reason why I am telling you that you need to make the commitment to tell yourself that you will not study the word of God until you have done certain things is so that you can have something visually to work with. But the, re the real power comes by the Holy Spirit. So today we are getting help. Praise the Lord. Today, we are getting help. The word of the Lord is very express in this place. It came in from that side and it looks like lightning and it went across the room with tentacles pointing down. And what it says is help is here. So I tell you today, let me tell you something. It is not by power nor by might. And, I, and the word of God means that very seriously. And I mean that very seriously also today. That the reason why you will get up and become a praying believer is because God is helping you today to arise from your sleep and to wake up from your slumber. The stone has been rolled away. Wherever you might be right now, I want you to take a posture that helps you to be very focused. A posture that allows for you to be receptive. Some of you would have to stand. Some of you may kneel. Some of you may roll on the floor. But I don't believe that any one of you should be sitting down because we know that sitting down isn't particularly a posture for reception. And so I would encourage you to, 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 to arise and take a different posture. When Jesus healed people, he told them to arise. He never healed anybody and said to them, just sit where you're at. No, he would say to them, arise, take up your bed, arise and walk, arise. And so rising up and taking a different posture is an act of faith that lets heaven know that you're ready. It's a way of saying now you can plug me in and turn it on. Holy Spirit, I'm ready for the power. <laughs> Ye mando so, ye kunde mando so, mando so, mande suta mo undere alaba. Ye kunde mando so, mando so, mando so, ye kunde mando so, mando so, mando so. Yekum de mando so, yekum de mando so. Aburum de si, mamando kum da la tari I see the water flowing, and the Lord says, Come and drink. Mamando so, yekum de rias yemonda, makum stili aborodos kotole de liba. The Lord is stretching forth your hand, his hand to you. He says, Put your hand in my hand, I am pulling you out. 
Oh, Marquis and the neighborhood does that. You will not miss the advances of the Holy Spirit that is coming to you now. You will not miss, I declare over you, the advances of the Holy Spirit that is coming over you, that is coming to you in days to come. When you hear that voice, you will respond. When you hear that voice, you will come to life. When you hear his voice, you will wake up from your sleep and you will no longer give sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. But now you would watch and pray. You will be sober and you will be vigilant. You will study the word of God with love and with passion. You will pray with so much zest and zeal. You will pray also in the sweetness of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Kadari sotale abu shumande obum shumande la protis ketale darigidaba. Father, we thank you because you sent your angel to roll away the stone. Let us be able to push away the slab and arise as good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, showing diligence in the things of the Spirit, showing diligence in the things of faith, showing diligence in the things of spiritual maturity, Showing diligence and commitment in the things of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, above all, may, uh, may we fall in love with your word again, afresh. For a man of God to be perfect and be thoroughly furnished on to good works he has the scriptures for a man of God to be perfect and be thoroughly furnished on to good works he has the scripture I remember that song was the song that we were taught and as we sang that song as little children, our hearts were overwhelmed with love for the Word of God. When other children are playing, the games were no longer as interesting as the pages of the book of John. Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you for that mercy that I found. Thank you for that grace that found me. Thank you for that mercy your mercy that found me and your grace that I found that brought me to your word that brought me in love into love with your precepts Lord I pray that every single person here today that you have chosen to deliver from sleep and from slumber that you have chosen to deliver from worldliness that you have chosen to de deliver this day from the heaviness of the flesh Every single one of them, Lord, will have a similar testimony wherein their hearts are beating with love for your word, wherein their eyelids are open and alert for times of prayer. Let the lamp Burn with flame. Halekum, shalekum. Halekum, light the flame. Let the lamp burn with flame for you. I'm excited because I see the flame of prayer, of the lamp of prayer being ignited in this place tonight. Some of us already caught it from a few days ago. Some of us are catching it now. Now, we're catching it now. And the Lord himself will open his word to you. I want you to, some of you may have to note this day as you know that the day that you gave, that you got born again. You see, because getting born again for many of us is coming to add to the number of people that God has. But today you are adding to the number of people that have God. Isn't that awesome? Because see, God is not desperate for people. People are the one that should be desperate for God. 
Makele dori alama ko zi alama ko zi alama ko zi alama ko ko zi alama ko zi alama zi alama ko yere me amala ko se alama alama ko apri alama mahala ko sha apri alama ko abere de alama ko si tele me alama ko rala li ke robo do shi alama isi ya me de alama ko you see the picture that was painted for me right now is that many of us the Lord is going to hide us in the cleft of the rock destruction will not even find you. The Lord is putting a seal upon your deliverance such that the people that would reach out to the phone to call you will not find your number. When they try to call you, their batteries will be out. When they try to bother you, they will miss their way. When they try to bring distraction, they will not find you because the Lord is ready for you to be groomed in righteousness in this season. Give Him praise. 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 Siela mando di ala baka kasiya, ababa kasiya, ababa kasiya, ababa kasiya. Barando shendele dari ge deba. And if you happen to have fallen on this broadcast, or this broadcast has happened to fall upon you, and you're like, "Wow, I like what I'm hearing, but I don't even know the first thing about beginning this journey with the Lord Jesus." The Lord Jesus is the only begotten Son of God who became a man just like you and me, so that He can take your punishment and take your shame, nail it to the cross, so that He could die, go to hell, and take that which Satan has taken away from you that precious destiny and restore it to you by giving you the authority to live a glorious life. That Lord Jesus did all of that for you so that you can have a life that is full of God's love and grace. And the only way you engage that love is to believe that he did all of that for you and to open your mouth and say thank you Jesus for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for coming for me. Thank you, Jesus, for being raised for me. From now onwards, I just want to be like you. From now onwards, I will read about you in scriptures. I will pray to you in the morning and also pray to you at night. From now onwards, I will not do a thing without seeking you first. From now onwards, I believe that I am born again because I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that I'm born again because I have confessed it with my mouth. I believe that from here onwards, my name is written in God's book of life and I will live every day led by His Holy Spirit until He comes to take me and transform me into an eternal being. You say that prayer and you are born again. In the mighty name of Jesus, God is good. Alrighty, I thank God for your life. Let us hear from you if this is from the broadcast or from an online platform. But for those of you that are here, I want to say thank you for making yourself available for the tutoring of the Holy Spirit today. You will never remain the same. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Say tarabati ke tuashi. Let's give God praise. Hey sarabas. There's none like you, O God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to continue to worship God in our giving. If my dear brother would help us with the offering slide, please. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful work that you do in us. For your glory. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. So the giving details are on the screen now. Um, if you need to utilize an envelope, we have the offering basket here as well as pens. And so let's just take a couple of minutes. If you have given already, that's fine. If you need to give now, let's go ahead and do that. We're going to wait just a couple of seconds and just soak in his presence as we prepare our offering. Hasibo suhuta, suto rebes, mahi se tu rebas, akati bo suhuta rebos, sehi tarabas. Hallelujah. Lord God, we thank you for this night, O oh God. We thank you that you have seen about us, that you deal with us beautifully, O oh God, that you deliver us. Father, we thank you for the man and woman of God that you have placed before us to minister to us deep unto deep, O oh God. Lord, we ask of thee that these offerings before you be pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling unto you, O oh God. 
Father, I thank you for you have seen about each and every one of us in our households this evening, oh God. We thank you for the fresh impartation, the fresh stirring, oh God, to run with you, to walk alongside you, oh God, to seek you, to be deep down in your word. Father, we thank you that this fire that you have started in us, O oh God, will be used to ignite, O oh God, the ones that you have called us to minister to, O oh God, the ones that you have called to our circle of influence, Lord, that they may run with it, all, with it also, and that those that you have called them to be a circle of influence too, that they may run with it also, O oh God. All glory and honor belong to you, Lord. We thank you for speaking to us even in our giving, O oh God, that it be pleasing unto you. All glory and honor belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So very quickly, uh, the Lord will have me lay hands on people, as many people as one, to receive an impartation of the things that have been declared. There is a, there is a level of ease that comes with impartation. You know, you can watch somebody on a cooking show and learn how to cook, but it's different when you are there in the same kitchen as they are. And for those of us who are here today, I believe there is an added privilege to actually be physically present. So we can make this a quick walk of righteousness as many people as would like to have that impartation for the things that have been so declared concerning the word, the prayer, and the overall awakening and arising and appearing. You see, because you awake, you arise, and then you appear. Many of us up until now have been awoken and we have arisen, but we haven't appeared because of the storm that is yet to be rolled away. In the mighty name of Jesus, let your heart be in love with becoming like Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus, let your heart be in love let your heart long and thirst after that image of Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. To be like Jesus, to be like him, to be like Jesus from glory to glory, to behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, from this moment onwards, you will seek him and you will find him in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you because as you have shown to me, I do by the laying on of hands to stir up the gifts that are the, on the inside of these ones. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, the gifts are being stirred up to pursue after righteousness, to seek, to sow. The Lord says you will sow unto yourself in righteousness and you will reap in mercy. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, you are the one that never forgets our labor of love. In love, this one will labor to become more like Christ, he and his household in the mighty name of Jesus, to be like Jesus. Even from when he was a little lad, he would reason scriptures with those who are scholars. None of us is too little to fall in love with and to know the Lord for ourselves. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will grow in the admonition of the things of God. Your heart will seek the truth of God's word, even with the midnight oil. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you because you have called us to be like you in holiness and purity, in love and in all things because we are to live out the full express image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is your portion in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you because this man, you will open his eyes to see your footprints in the sand, Lord Jesus, that he may put his steps where you have walked in that path that is called the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, every weight that is standing at the door, every stone that is standing in the way, let them be rolled out that this woman will come out shining as the light, even the light of your love to the world in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. Who else? Anybody? So unto yourself in righteousness and you will reap in mercy. For you, it will be a sacrifice, but it is a sacrifice that will pay off. At the end of each day, it will pay off because you are getting closer and closer 
to that full stature of the woman of God that you are in Jesus name father in Jesus name I thank you because this one is a good soldier of the cross and so no entanglement will keep him from making the sacrifice that is needed to get into your word that your word might get into him in fullness in the mighty name of Jesus I thank you for my brother here Lord his mind will be open by revelation unto revelation your mind will open up for the multiplication of revelation and insight into the deep things of God father in Jesus name I thank you because this one Lord you are gifting Lord in the old as well as in the new you see while many people see the Old Testament as a bunch of stories as you get into it to you it will be a set of strategies and principles for living and for understanding the love with which your Heavenly Father has loved you which is an everlasting love in the mighty name of Jesus father I thank you father in Jesus name I thank you for this woman here thank you Lord in Jesus name because Hey, you know what? Let me tell you something. I want to move away from there because of the howling sound. David said, one thing have I desired and that will I seek after. That I may do well in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Let me tell you something. You will seek to be with him more than you want to be with them. More than you want to do things. More than you want to go anywhere else. Your heart will genuinely fall in love with, with the presence of God. With the word of God. You will sit there and time will pass. And you will grow. In the name of Jesus. You are one of the ones that has been hidden on the cleft of the rock. Your detractors will not find you. Anyone who is sent from the pit of hell to distract you. To steal the passion of God's word from your heart will not find you. And when they find you, that passion and that grace of God upon your life will overpower them in Jesus' name. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you because this one shall be said to be one of the sons of the prophets. Lord, you will school him in righteousness and tutor him in your grace. And Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, he will learn even the deep things and the mysteries of your word in the mighty name of Jesus let the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of the knowledge of the things of God rest mightily upon you from now onwards in the name of Jesus praise God let me tell you something as soon as I as soon as you called me I saw you climbing up. I was excited. I said, it's climbing up. And the Lord said to me, he says, I want you to pay attention to the uniqueness of what I am showing you. Now I see the ability to read without eyes. You see, the Lord has you climbing up. You're climbing up in the prophetic. But I saw you deep in your hand, in the back, in the pouch that you carry. And you're able to read the scrolls almost as a blind man reads by Braille. So your eye is on where you're going in the gifting. But the Lord is saying that you will also continue to attain the knowledge of his word. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for this special grace. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let me tell you the way that it happens so that when it starts happening, you'll recognize it. What will begin to happen is you will begin to know and remember scriptures that you have not even read in a while. And you'll be wondering, is that even in the Bible? And then you will go and find it there. It's the way of the prophets because God needs you to be multi-dimensional and so he's brought you into that realm it's a great place to be stay fired up God bless you I prayed for you didn't I did I pray for you already I think I did Lord in the mighty name of Jesus I thank you because this one has stayed for a double portion and none will deny her that which she seeks you know I, I see what it is so there is a hunger and a thirst you seek clarity you want to know what you are called but the Lord says begin with the word because that which the Lord has for you you need to learn the alphabet of you need to be able to decipher it when it comes so just begin with the word stay in that place of the word and everything that you seek to hear you have already heard and then you will understand in the mighty name of Jesus praise the Lord God is good alrighty one more thing I'm just gonna say this um, and we're gonna close the Lord says to me to talk to you about Tuesday you see, this Tuesday, I want you to come with a robe if you have one. So that if you have to fall and roll on the ground, we will not be looking for garments to cover you. The word of the Lord has come forth. Get ready. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm not going to hold this. We thank God for the word that has come forth. 
Tuesday, let's get ready. Please, if you can, invite someone. I'm excited for what the Lord is doing here in this house. It's such a privilege. It's such a privilege to know that the Lord speaks to us plainly. Father, we give you praise and we just thank you. Lord, we love you. Father, we declare that we will take what we have received this night and we will run with it by your Holy Spirit, with your helping hand, oh God. Lord, we give all glory unto you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Everyone have a blessed week.